Hi everybody and welcome back to Electrified Veronica, where we're talking about electric vehicle and battery technology. As you can see, today I am out in the middle of nowhere with an electric car. And I want to talk about how much did electric vehicle technology improve already and where does it take us in the future? Just think about range. So how far can we go on one charge? If we think back 10 years ago, an average electric car could go around 100 kilometers on one charge. Now this number has tripled in the past decade. And we see similar trends for charging. The first electric cars would only do slow charging. And today really the state of the art is DC fast charging. Now the question is, how can technology improve in the future and where are really the technological limits? To discuss this today, I have some support. <laughs> Mark, you are General Manager, Electric Vehicle Powertrain at Texas Instruments. What is TI doing in the electrification area? Well, it's really simple. Uh, TI is involved in the design, manufacture, and selling of semiconductor devices. And we're really trying to work on four things for electric uh, EVs. Uh, we're trying to maximize driving range, to enable a much better charging experience, to enable more affordable EVs and also to enable safer operation. You're also a very passionate EV driver, right? I am. Uh, I've been driving electric for uh, five years now and prior to that I've been driving uh, hybrids for three years. So I've been on this journey for quite a while. <laughs> My husband Don is electrical engineer and has worked in the EV and battery industry for the past 20 years. Yeah, so most of that time was spent on testing all the electrified components in an electric vehicle and now we're uh, doing our own conversion so it's a lot of fun. So the three of us are not only working in the EV industry but we're also passionate EV drivers. So what do you think? Should we go for a road trip? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Let's go. Let's do it. Who's the driver? Me. I take shotgun. Ready? Okay, ready. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, oh my oh. god! Stop! <laughs> What's wrong? I'm going to be the driver. All right, Veronica's time to do donuts. <laughs> <laughs> Whee! Yay! We just got to drive like normal. Oh. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about range. You know, like 10 years ago, you would have the EVs going 60 miles, maybe 100 kilometers. And you know, today it's pretty much 200, 300 miles. And there are some car makers announcing a thousand mile battery as well as battery manufacturers. What do you think about these advancements? This is actually one of my favorite topics, right? Range is a function of several factors. How heavy this car is, you know, what the drag level is, like whether it's windy or not, um, you know, whether we're going uphill or downhill, what is the, the charging and discharging profile. Um, how has this battery been used over time? How long has it been used? And I guess, Veronica, you like to do donuts in the, in the, in the desert, right? I so, love that. I mean, that, the computer will then say, okay, you're, you've got a lead foot. And um, then it'll say, okay, your range is gonna be a lot less than when Don's driving, because he's a much better driver. Things have gotten better because the analog circuitry, the semiconductor technology behind this has gotten a lot more accurate. The overall resolution of our analog to digital converters, our speed of our converters, you know, the, the, the overall performance of our chips has gotten to the point where we are very, very accurate in terms of calculating the voltage and the current. Right. And on top of that, we're able to, you know, get the voltage and the currents measured to a very precise time window such that I can derive things like impedance, which will then tell me more characteristics of the battery cells. I mean, I also think like battery technology itself, the chemistry, 
really there were a lot of advancements and also on the cooling and heating, the thermal management, that has a huge impact mm -hmm. on, on driving range. Maybe we can talk a little bit about like how does the driving style, how does temperature affect the range? We can really see that the computer takes the temperature into account and really dramatically drops the temperature range. And, and we're really seeing this kind of in the headlines is that people don't understand that and they look at the, let's say the estimated range on the sticker when they go by the vehicle. Um, and in the spring, summer and fall, it's, it's, it's getting the range that they are anticipating, but then in the winter time, um, they're not seeing it. And I think this is one of the big things that we need to do in the industry is to make people aware of what's really going on and why that temperature is affecting the range so much. Um, it's both partly due to the battery. It's also partly due to the fact that you have to heat up the humans that are inside the vehicle and that takes energy from the traction battery as well. Um, Preconditioning can do some things to help things out. Um, but you know, these are all parts of the algorithm that the battery management system is taking into account when it throws that range number up and it says, hey, you can drive 200 miles in this temperature on this route. And uh, that's why it, the exciting advancements in BMS technologies is really great because the more confident that people are about that number when they get in the vehicle makes their overall driving experience much better. I mean, battery cells and, and battery packs and general, like battery cells are kind of like living things, right? I mean, they like a specific temperature range. Yep. If it's too extreme, either on the hot or the cold side, they're either going to, you know, fail or they're malfunctioning. And it basically you operate it out of, their, out of their safe area. So they have a very specific range, which they want to be operated at. Right. And yeah, in that respect, they don't like it too hot, too yeah. cold. Yeah. yeah. Now, my question is right now, state of the art, we have 300 miles, 400, 500 miles for passenger cars. Do we really need more? I would say yes, right? I, I don't think you can ever have enough. Um, I live in a very different environment from where, you know, the US or other areas which are quite large. So I'm quite fortunate to be in Hong Kong where the overall area is very small. So I have access to charging stations, uh, you know, within 10 minutes of each other. But in wider swaths of the US, for example, and we're actually headed to a, a, a charging station now, right? Um, you've, you have to plan your trip accordingly to actually you know, make sure that you have enough range to get to that charging station. And so- Yes. So, you know, once you're doing road trips and once you're doing road trips in the Midwest, what we are doing, I would say, I'm not really talking about range anxiety anymore but really more about, it's more about charging anxiety. So will I actually find a charger that works? That's right. And in the US, you know, what do you do if one's broken and you've driven, you know, 20 kilometers or let's say 50 miles um, and it's broken, then what, right? Yeah. And that's, that's what charging anxiety is, is what if I get there and there is no charger yeah, that works. Exactly. Okay, so we're fast charging now. This is normally the time where I would watch an episode of Gilmore Girls. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate a little bit more? What is now the difference between AC and DC charging? So we see these big cabinets in the back. And so this is actually taking the energy that we saw earlier coming from the solar power. And it's taking that AC energy and converting it into high power DC. So we're talking multiple hundreds of kilowatts of power. And we're hearing more and more about 350 kilowatt and now megawatt charging. And this is converting that into DC energy that we plug directly into the car. We can fill up the battery very quickly. So hundreds of kilowatts, we're slamming tons and tons of current through the vehicle. Yep. In AC to DC, I've got to take that exact same cabinet, which, what is that thing, like maybe four or five feet tall, right? And I've got a, you know, the currently state of the art, we're looking at 22 kilowatt, um, and, and that has to fit in a very small box called an onboard charger. So that onboard charger is taking AC from, let's say, uh, your garage, you're taking that and converting it to DC on your car. And that's got to be as small as possible. Yeah, and you know, I think it's really a matter of location too, so, AC charging would mostly happen, you know, at home, overnight, it takes a couple of hours, and DC fast charging is really what's meant to be on a road trip. Now, 
we're probably charging for 10 20 minutes but a lot of people out there are actually talking about a five minute fast charge what do you think from a technological aspect could really pave the way towards a five minute charge so this is actually my favorite topic right because i had mentioned our mission as a semiconductor company is to really improve the overall charging experience right that's what it's all about is how do i get parity with regards to charging on an electric vehicle versus like filling up gas right when i can reach five minutes of charging that basically uh it, it, it removes every single barrier um and how do i do that in order to do that i need to have power converters right either larger you know, these big guys out there that are you know, handling tons of current or these small ones they've got to be incredibly efficient and they you don't have a lot of space for them and those are kind of two factors that work against each other the amount of heat that you generate in trying to do kilowatts of charging 22 kilowatts 100 kilowatts you need to use state-of-the-art silicon you know the industry is looking at wide band gap semiconductor material you might have heard about uh, gallium nitride GAN um, you know we have drivers for those types of solutions we have you know microcontrollers to you know control the algorithms to control those power stages but you really need to have a as small as possible um, form factor and able to be able to get rid of those that heat as much as you can yeah i think another aspect is also moving over to higher voltage systems you know and the other industry trend is really towards 800 volts yes. this will bring the current down this will bring the heat down yes and and so we do see that um out there right and the benefit of 800 volt again is that you can take advantage of um, 800 volt uh, dc fast charging architectures right if the if your grid uh, in your municipality does support 800 volt dc fast charge then it can directly charge your 800 volt battery if you went on a road trip and did dc fast charging what would be your favorite show to watch gilmore girls <laughs> <laughs> Good answer, good answer. <laughs> That's a very good answer. Let's put in our final destination. This is our current state of charge. Um, you can see that we're at roughly 90% charge, right? So 89% is the current state of charge. And on the trip, it's already calculated for us the anticipated range consumption. Um, by the end of the, t by the time we get to the Las Vegas sign, we'll be at yeah. roughly 81.4 projected. This but, is the actual range prediction, a really convenient thing. So you know exactly when you arrive at your destination, um, which state of charge you're ending up with. But this is going back to the very beginning of our conversation where we talked about state of charge and then range calculation, right? So this is what the computer thinks will be doing, accounting for what it knows for terrain, um, how we've driven this vehicle. Like obviously we've done some donuts and we've done you know, some punching of the gas. What? Um, but you know, it's, it's saying that it assumes you're going to be at this level. Um, but in actuality, we may deviate from that, right? We may actually be um, under it, meaning that we're uh, using more power, more more charge than expected. Or we may, we may actually have a light foot and actually be, cons be cruising and actually be better than what the computer thinks. So let's take a look at it. Yeah, yeah let's see what happens. I heard we get to do donuts again. Is that what I heard? No, we're not doing any donuts anymore. <laughs> what do you actually think about battery swapping as maybe an alternative or even complementary? Yeah, so the swappable batteries is another method, right? We were just at the solar farm. It's just another way to store the energy and, and actually, you know, we were at the DC fast charger. So instead of actually waiting let's say 10 minutes for the DC fast charger, we simply drive into a station and we have a mechanic, you know, swap a, ba a battery pack in there. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's another technology that's, that's coming up uh, and is, is actually implemented in China today. The other thing about swappable batteries is that there is different types of implementations of swappable batteries. So people are trying to swap the entire pack or people are trying to swap maybe individual modules inside of the pack. So as a quick highlight, you know, Texas Instruments is working on wireless BMS technology. And so wireless BMS 
would have suitable, it's very suitable for this type of application where you want to swap the modules directly in there. And that is one of the major research areas that we see in, and one of the major innovations that we see in the market. Um, and so wireless BMS is, is another key area that we see in terms of uh, market innovations. So what does it actually mean to have a wireless BMS? So what are the advantages? How does this work? So in a battery pack, you have all the cells in modules, right? Uh, in the classic BMS architecture. So um, each module maybe have 16 cells and you have all the modules that are connected to each other in, with wires. So you still have wires there. Yeah. And so you need to basically, you know, the communication goes through one module to another and then all the way back through to the battery management unit, the central unit. With wireless BMS, we don't need to have those wires anymore. We're basically sending that cell voltage and cell temperature data over uh, wirelessly and we actually optimize the, the battery cell placement within the pack. Because think about all the wires that you have, like even a, a Ethernet um, uh, configuration where you have this sort of rat's nest of wires, yeah. right? Just reducing wires gives you flexibility in, in cell placements. Um, you get uniformity, so we talked about swappable batteries, right? So if you just modules, I can actually just swap one module for another. So it's just the whole benefit of wireless in general, um, you know, freedom from wires and, and all that stuff. Yeah, so. so after Veronica has done all of the wiring in our modules in our Jeep conversion, I think <laughs> she would really appreciate a wireless solution. Absolutely. Yep, and we have the perfect part for that. Yeah, I think you made 120... 120 even. wires. Oh. By hand. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, we can we can look at helping you out. <laughs> ah, perfect. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting because people, you know, as you mentioned before, once we get to that five minute um, refueling mark or recharging uh, mark, then we're on parity with the internal combustion engine vehicles, and really, then the, a lot of the barriers that are preventing people from going electric um, are gone. And I think, you know. Swappable batteries is, is a method that people are looking into. Um, it has its pros and cons, just like everything. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Another topic that will completely change the game for me is charging from the road while you're driving. Like, can you imagine this road was prepared in a way that we can charge while we are driving on it? That is basically, that is what motivates me. Um, I think we are honestly at the, you know, the, the beginning phase of electrification, if you will. Um, there is so much more that can be done. I mean, once we reach that stage where we're able to drive and continuously charge, um, you know, we remove complete reliance on, you know, the cables and, and we are in a, a wireless charging mode, right? So, yeah. And you know, there is a couple of pilot programs already in Sweden that will be the first uh, charging from the road, a pilot in Detroit, I think, in the US. Mm -hmm. And I think what fascinates me is that if you can do this, you can really reduce the battery size a lot, right? Because right now, if we want to increase range, we need to increase battery capacity. We, we need to add weight to the car. But if you can just drive from the road, you you can just come up with smaller batteries, smaller resources. And you know, the, batteries is, is, the battery is the most expensive component of, of a vehicle, right? So if you can actually reduce the size of a battery, then you're, reduce, you're making EVs more affordable, right? And that's why technology is so important. Um, we've got to measure everything so accurately. We've got to predict things better. Um, we've got to, you know, just enable the industry to utilize the full uh, energy that's, that's available in a battery pack without over designing. So this is a very telling story about how Veronica uh, drives, right? So as I, as we, <laughs> on, as analyze we, me. Yes, exactly. So as we were talking, I couldn't, I don't know if you noticed, but we were, I, you couldn't tell because the cameras were facing us, but we were going, you know, downhill a lot of the time. And so, you know, this is the gray line is basically what the computer told us that, you know, that's our expected state of charge. We were talking about regenerative, regenerative braking. We were going to get some energy back, right? By the fact that we were going downhill, um, we don't, we don't have to step on the gas. So that's why we were discharging and then we would actually gain some energy back. But Veronica being the Veronica that she is with the lead foot, you can see that the orange line is saying that she's underperforming what the computer expected her to do. 
because she was stepping on the gas a lot harder. Hey, I'm just teaching her well how to drive in America. <laughs> I think that's the really cool part is having this information available, which a lot of it comes from the BMS. It's coming from the algorithms that are gathered during testing. It allows the user to adjust their driving styles in order to drive the most efficient way possible. And, and here you see, right? So yep. Veronica is stepping on the, she's stepping on the gas like she normally does. And now the curve is starting to go the other way because the computer is saying, oh. hey, she's back to normal. So I guess other than the entire experience of owning an EV and, and the convenience of charging at home, you know, what, what, what else do you love about char driving electric? So honestly, what, what I like is there's a very, uh, there's a pleasure in, in driving or st stepping on the pedal. Um, and that again, I go back to SOC, right? When you step on the pedal uh, on an EV, there is an instantaneous power and torque that's delivered. And I think everybody's seen the YouTube videos where there's a supercar that's driving against an electric car and the electric car off the line um, will beat those kind of the, the internal combustion engine supercars. And that's really because the battery technology that's out there, uh, they can deliver maximum state of power, or state of charge at nominal temperature. Before they start heating up, they can deliver super um, energy density at that point. And that's why, you know, you get, when you step on the gas like Veronica does, and by the way, we should go back to this curve because we can yeah. actually see how how poorly yeah. she's actually doing. How am I doing? <laughs> so, but it's you all can, orange. But you can actually see, yes. yeah, how you're you're actually able to get so much power by just stepping on the gas. Yeah, you know, it's really convenient driving. You can pass people very quickly. It's very easy driving to me. Yeah, and I think you know the the very unique thing about uh, electric vehicle propulsion systems is you can have more motors, more smaller motors, so one on each wheel. There's new, you know, technology to do torque vectoring. You know, you're doing traction control with the electric motors. And of course, you need to have some power to be able to do those types yeah. of things, which has a side benefit, of course, of having, you know, like the Rivian, which is 900 horsepower or whatever for their truck, really having a lot of power to, to accelerate quite quickly. Um, but the overall importance of all of that is it makes electric vehicles more safe you know in slippery conditions like in the rain or in the snow um, the electric vehicle can actually do a lot of correction factors many hundreds or thousands of times per second um, in order to make the driving situation safer for for everybody on the road so right. i think that's really an interesting aspect right it's, it's all about technology uh, which is driving this electrification movement forward <music> Vegas, baby. Now we can do anything because everything stays in Las Vegas. Except donuts. Except donuts. Yes, they're <laughs> forbidden. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me on this little electrified road trip. We started out in the middle of nowhere. We made it through solar fields and fast charging stations. And now we made it to Las Vegas. I have three little questions for you and you're only allowed to answer with yes or no. Do we need more range for electric cars? For me? Yes. No. Do we need faster charging in the future? Yes. Yes. What do you think of performance for electric cars? Do we need more or is it okay? Yes, we need more, of course, always. Always, more. always. And now Same. I have one question. Hang on. <laughs> I have one question you can only answer yes or no. Yes. Did you like Don's Donuts? No! <laughs> <laughs> Stay electrified. Goodbye!